Good evening. We're going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Dr. Foley, roll call. President Reese, members of the board, please let the record show that three members are present. Thank you. All right, we are going to have a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. I would like to ask during the moment of silence that we please keep um, Lieutenant Brackman's family, friends and colleagues in our thoughts and prayers. Um, they are a Higley family and um, please keep them in your thoughts. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go on to the agenda. I move that we approve the agenda as it's presented. Second. Any questions or comments regarding the agenda? All those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carries 3-0. Dr. Foley, the superintendent's report, please. President Reese, members of the board, we start tonight with one of our very favorite parts of our meetings, which is the celebration of our points of pride. Tonight, we have our littlest, our littlest members of the Higley community in, in our audience that we are so happy to celebrate tonight. So I'm going to start by welcoming Miss Patty Gleason and Mrs. Stacy Utley up to come up. So And these beautiful, lovely ladies are going to highlight for us our points of pride. We'll be starting with our Cooley Early Childhood Development Center. One of our, I thought I was doing pretty good without it even. Um, one of our favorite nights tonight, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, President Reese, members of the governing board, so good to see you and be here with you tonight, and members of our cabinet. Um, again, one of our favorite nights to celebrate our Cooley and our Sossaman uh, points of pride. And of course, we start with Cooley because C comes before S. So, with our, we would first like to have Patty Moore please come forward. Okay, Patty was chosen because, well, F, she's just absolutely amazing. But she's an, and I'm going to read from the script tonight so I don't forget all the good stuff. Um, Patty is an engaging, thoughtful teacher. She takes our brilliant beginning students on a fun academic exploration every day while consistently seeking to build social, emotional skills and positive relationships with her students. And she is amazing. When she first came to interview with me, um, it was for a kinder prep position. And she has animals and takes care of horses and animals. On, she's got a farm at home. And as soon as we started talking, I told her, oh, no, you're a brilliant beginnings teacher. You just don't know it yet. And she has been amazing in that classroom. And it's a perfect place for you. So every day, she brings um, every lesson to life with her own innovative sense of wonder and deep understanding of early childhood development. In fact, one of the ways that she do does that in the classroom is by creating two dramatic play centers so the children have plenty of opportunities to um, act in those places and then take on roles of others, which is so important as they build those social emotional skills. Um, her students and families can't wait to see her every day, and her colleagues love and admire her. So I'd like to recognize Patty Moore tonight. Oh, okay. 
And next we have our classified points of pride, Ashley Brennan, will you please come forward? So Ashley is brand new with us. She's brand new, but her, her mom and her sister have also worked for us in the center. Um, so it's really wonderful to have the Brennan family. And we have some openings. I'm always asking Michelle, do you have any more other daughters available? Because <laughs> she has 10 children um, all in the district. So um, Miss Ashley has quickly become a part of our Cooley, um, Cooley Little Cougars family. Our students request her, celebrate her, and send her well wishes. Miss Ashley approaches each student with a playful presence, a loving tone, and an open heart. She is willing to jump in and help all students, families, and staff on campus. Ashley is always looking to help others in her pod and on our campus. She even checks to make sure that the kids club um, um, Miss Cindy is all set with her children uh, before she leaves for the day. Her ability to learn quickly and her love for young children allowed her to take the lead when her teacher was absent, working alongside the sub, but again, taking the teacher lead. Willing to put in the time, she has stellar attendance and is super reliable. Students can count on Miss Ashley's consistency and her presence, and we love her so much. Thank you. <laughs> And next, we will, would love to acknowledge and recognize Amelia Dorsey as our volunteer point of pride for Cooley. All right, Miss Amelia volunteers with our PTO and is currently our ECDC PTO secretary. We are very grateful for the time she gives each week. She quietly comes in and quickly distributes birthday grams for our preschool students, decorates for teacher luncheons, and is always willing to lend a hand. She's a busy working mother and author, and she wrote a book about her daughter, who was so excited that daddy just had to take her out for a little bit. But it's entitled, um, her daughter Eden, and it's titled Awesome Spectacular Daughter, That's Me. I know, it's a wonderful book, and many of my teachers have already purchased it for their classrooms. She is very friendly, and we have enjoyed getting to know her a little more this year and appreciate all she's done for our students, our teachers, and our families. And if I could have Patty Moore back up again, because um, next uh, for us to celebrate tonight is a young man in Patty Moore's class. His name is Hudson Barger. Hudson, will you please come forward? So to know Hudson is to absolutely love and adore him. I just can't say enough about this little guy. Each day he comes to our classroom, he has the biggest smile on his face, and he always has at least one or two stories to tell me. So um, he is a kind friend. He's compassionate. He's a great friend to his classmates. And uh, since we're a social-emotional program, I set some goals for him to increase the communication that he has with his classmates during our free choice center time. And this little guy blew my goals right out of the water. He took over my small groups in my classroom, taught three five-minute lessons about the Venus flytrap, which was his choice of topic, and uh, completed it with a question and answer session in the end. I frankly think he's after my job. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Uh, it's just my pleasure to be here for Hudson and to have him receive this award. So, love you. And Hudson, this is for you. Thank <laughs> you. 
You know, so special. It's what we do every day. I mean, it's, you need to come into the classrooms. I'm so glad we have volunteers able to come in now because you get to see exactly what we do every day, connecting with the children. And this is what happens, I know, when we're able to do that, which it's, we're specialists in that. So it's so good. All right, so we're going to switch gears and move on to Sossaman. And our uh, certified teacher that we are honoring tonight is Missy Childs. <laughs> And we are so happy to have Missy back in preschool this year. Actually, she's been recognized as Cooley Point of Pride, too. So she said her next goal is to be Teacher of the Year. So we're going to work on that. I know. <laughs> so Missy is back in preschool this year. We could not be happier to have her back. She teaches the full day Brilliant Beginnings class at Sossaman. And she is a ball of early childhood energy. That positive energy fuels the creativity she unleashes in her class as she captures the attention and love of her students and families. She engages those young minds with hands-on lessons and is constantly teaching and reinforcing those social emotional skills that will lay the foundation for future learning for her students. She is open and willing to help and support our families and colleagues in any way she can. This year, she volunteered to be our technology mentor and is piloting our new Learning Without Tears program. Her positivity is sunshine for our center, and I'm so hot, happy to honor Missy with our points of pride today. Our next point of pride recipient is Miss Chrissy Schaefer. Yay! Oh, and we are very honored to have her here as well. So Chrissy is a special education paraprofessional in Miss Crystal's STARS class at Sossaman. From the very first day of school, Chrissy has been so helpful. She is full of love for the students and staff in preschool and continually models kindness and compassion for all. She connects herself with the students and mo continually models kindness and compassion. Oh, excuse me. She connects with her students by being present and playful. Chrissy is confident in making decisions and working with some of the more challenging students in her classroom. She utilizes her knowledge of conscious discipline to help children learn to regulate themselves and make positive choices within the classroom family. As part of the classroom teaching team, she willingly shares ideas and is a whiz at keeping everything in her classroom organized. Chrissy went above and beyond this year to help another teacher who needed to leave to care for her mother, who came down with COVID. She came into the preschool over the weekend to hang some projects for, um, that the children had completed and to organize lessons for the class while the teacher was out of town. The teacher felt at peace while her students, um, with her mom, knowing that Chrissy was with the students in the classroom and loving on them all the time that she wasn't there. I am honored to work with Chrissy. She is one of the greatest blessings on our team and a wonderful person with a great worth ethic and a great example of a team player. And how neat is this that I'm also able to honor her son, Alex, tonight for our volunteer award, Alex Schaefer. Okay, I got it, thank you, Curtis. I know, I know. <laughs> 
Um, so he comes to the, he comes several times during the week to volunteer at Sossman. Um, he sweeps the outdoor uh, patio and recess area to keep it safe for the children, helps Miss Crystal Furman prep her classroom, and he made great connections with all the preschoolers in Miss Gonzalez's class during her absence as he helped his mom, Chrissy, even facilitating learning centers before he left to start his day in the middle school. Alex chose to assist for three hours on a Sunday to clean, restock, and prep lessons for Miss Rosemary while she was away. All of this without taking any credit for NJHS hours, just an act of kindness because it was the right thing to do. Um, it is an honor to highlight this young man and his thoughtfulness, kindness, and love for others. He is a model for all of us, and I'm so proud to shine the light on him tonight. We need more young people just like Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mom and Dad. You did a great job. Mm -hmm. And then our last award tonight goes to Miss Maddie, Mad Madeline Franzen. Oh! And Ms. Berkshire, if you'd come on up, please. Oh my gosh, this little sunshine. Can I tell you, every day we wait for her to come. She's one of the first ones to arrive, and we're all lined up in the front office because she runs around the desk and has to hug every one of us every day. It's so beautiful. I need my notes because I... <laughs> there. Thank you. My poor eyes. Madeline is a little ray of sunshine. Every day, she walks into our center. She stops at the front office. She stops at, with us. She stops and talks to all the, um, the parents. Today, when one of the parents was leaving, she said, goodbye, Jack's dad. And she just, she is our official greeter. She um, has a very positive attitude, and she helps others. When they're sad, she's kind to them and plays with them. Uh, we have a kindness tree in our classroom, and we put a heart up for um, the kids get to put them up when they're being kind to others. And she has a lot of hearts up there because she is very kind to others. And she's just fun to have in class. I mean, look at all this energy. This is so much fun. <laughs> oh. <laughs> ever, ever. So we're just honored to, uh, to honor her today. so much. Thank you for coming for our points of pride. We appreciate you coming. You are more than welcome to stay, but we also know that if you need to get home and enjoy time with your families, you may do so.
Okay. <laughs> President Reese, members of the board, if that doesn't make your day, I don't know what does. Um, to continue with the superintendent's report, we do have our upcoming events, and this is, as you can see, a busy time of year, but I also know that we are excited that some of these events that we haven't been able to do for a long time have returned. So just this week alone, tomorrow evening, we have our the Gilbert's 25th Annual Community Excellence Award, where we'll be able to celebrate and acknowledge a classified, a teacher, and a volunteer for the Higley District for the town of Gilbert. On Friday, we have our superintendent visit where we're gonna visit the Sharks over at Chaparral. Um, also that evening, we have our Higley Achievement Foundation Monte Carlo night, which is a big fundraiser for our Achievement Foundation, and we are super excited about that evening. The following week, obviously, is our Thanksgiving holiday, and obviously, while we enjoy time with our own families, we are certainly thankful for our Higley families and our colleagues as well. The following week, um, we have our East Valley Boards Consortium meeting for those who are able to attend, and we will be treated to the delights of the culinary of friends at Eat It. Um, then in December, we have a governing board meeting. Um, so as you can see, the next several weeks, we have lots of events and keep us super busy. So that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Foley. And I just want to make a quick note that Mrs. Schultz was able to call in, so she's joining us uh, via Teams. I believe she has lost connection um, since, since we called in and we're no longer. Okay. Well, hopefully she'll be able to rejoin. So she's trying. She's trying. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. We will move on to board comments. President Reese. Mrs. Wilson. I was able to go to the All Together Now um, musical that happened over at Williams Field, and I actually went Saturday night. I know there was many performances, um, and that included Cooley, Sossaman, and B Higley, and Williams Field, and it was just a great show. I'm assuming some of the other board members got to go as well, and that was fantastic. And I also got to visit um, the Veterans Day celebration from the town of Gilbert put on, um, and Mrs. Martins was also there, and it was just fab fabulous. Our kids did a great job. Um, Junior ROTC and our um, Power Ranch Elementary, and I believe one more, and it was a secondary school, played instruments. So I can't remember which one, though. So, But it was fabulous. They did a great job. I'm very impressed with all the musical talents that we have and all the fun things that we're doing at Higley. Thank you. Any other board comments? All right, then we'll go ahead and move on. Mrs. Reach, do we have any requests to speak? Okay. Then we'll go on. I move that we approve our consent agenda as it's presented to us. Second. Questions or comments? I want to acknowledge Lowe's for their donation to our district. They, they give a lot to us and we appreciate it. The Lowe's at Higley and Queen Creek. So um, I, I wanna give them a shout out and thank them for everything that they do for our district. Anything else? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carries 3-0. All right, we're gonna go on to our information items to our classified compensation study. President Reese, members of the board, this evening that we have a presentation for you on a, on a classified compensation study. Tonight is an information item that will come back to you again in December for a vote. Tonight, um, Mum Martins is in a, a conference and she is also available with us um, via a Teams meeting to help answer questions. But in preparation for this evening, one of the things that she's done is she and Tyler have recorded the presentation almost like a little video that we will show you first, and then we will be able to process and answer any questions. This will also be helpful because when we send out a board summary to our employees, we'll be able to link this little video that explains the same presentation you'll be getting. So if you'll, if you'll stay tuned, we'll play the presentation and then answer any questions at the end, and Mum is online um, on a Teams meeting, and we'll bring her up to help answer 
answer any questions you have. Good evening, President Reese, Vice President Wilson, members of the board, and our Higley community. Tonight, Mr. Tyler Moore and myself will be presenting the recent classified compensation study. Let's first talk about why we're here tonight. We're here because of the new minimum wage increase for the state of Arizona, effective January 1, 2022. It is shifting up to $12.80 an hour. Some of you on the board may recall that in the spring of 2019, the district went out with seven other school districts to do a compensation and classification study. We had hired JB Reward Systems to help us with that process. However, back in the spring of 2019, that was pre-COVID. We didn't know what we'd be dealing with in terms of the mass shortage of frontline workers across the nation. We're all competing for the same labor pool. Prior to this shortage of frontline workers, Higley always struggled with certain classified non-exempt positions. They're listed there, but you could see our bus drivers, custodians, paraprofessionals, lunch aides, crossing guards, and ground workers. When we went into the classification and compensation study with Mr. Vance Jacobson from JB Rewards, we knew that we had low hourly rates. Based on the budget of what we had at the time, as well as the dynamics of minimum wage going up as it related to Prop 206, we knew we had to do some things to not only address our pay, but also in relation to our salary compression. What we didn't know then that we do now know is that with COVID, it's really impacted our communities in so many different ways. And what we're seeing now as people are returning to work and organizations and areas are opening back up, is that there are a shortage of workers out there and we're competing for the same pool of individuals. We're seeing stories in radio, print, and television that individuals are waiting for the job they want and not just taking any job. We're also seeing stories about businesses and corporations around the valley offering starting higher rates beyond the minimum that's about to take into effect. We're seeing stories from Amazon where they're starting people off as high as $19.35 an hour, and we're seeing sign-on bonuses happening across the valley. Just the other day, I was at the Wendy's down the street, and for manager positions, they're looking at $20,000 sign-on bonuses. We're seeing bus driver shortage all across, as we mentioned earlier, and it's even a harder hit with this shortage of frontline workers. But locally, within the last few months, we've seen districts around us giving increases to their bus drivers or all their classified, and those have ranged from $1.50 to $2 more per hour on their currently hourly rate. We're seeing new stories that are happening across the nation, a lot in the Northeast, in which they had to delay the start of in-person instruction because of the bus driver shortage. We saw the governor of Massachusetts call on their National Guard because they're required to have CDLs to come in and start driving kids to school so in-person instruction could happen. We know that there's competition, and we always know there's competition, but it's hard to be able to compete with the same labor pool when there's individuals who might be saying, I can make a dollar plus more an hour down the street and have different challenges than maybe what they would have with us in the school district and our systems. The next two slides are going to represent what our current classified non-exempt salary schedule looks like. So you can see that we have the classification and or the position title, the grade in which they fall under, and then what that current range is. You'll see both on slide four and on slide five where they are throughout the district. I also want to note particularly that these are individuals that had been with us in the 2020-2021 school year and then continued and came back in the 2021, now 2022 school year. You'll also notice that, if you recall, they did all get a 5% increase. So these ranges are slightly higher than the slide I'm going to show you a little bit later in the presentation. I do want to note that our para twos do get an extra 75 cents per hour, as well as our lead custodians do get an extra 50 cents per hour because of the additional duties that they do in those roles. I also want to note that our grade currently goes up to 123, but we don't have any classifications that go up that high. However, we do want to keep them open and available just in case there would warrant a need for a reclassification of a current hourly position. This is a slide that I just mentioned not too long ago. 
This is our current new hire salary schedule. And you'll notice that we don't have ranges because we did move away from ranges. We just went with a starting hourly rate that we felt was competitive based on the classification and compensation study that Mr. Vance Jacobson did. And we did that intentionally because of the fact we also knew we'd have to work with our salary compression. You'll notice on there, however, though, we always knew that bus drivers was going to be an issue, and that's why we did make an exception for those individuals coming in at our bus driver area, which is currently a grade 110. Last board meeting, you may recall that you also did see a plan out of our ESSER funds to work with our bus drivers and looking at not only a referral bonus, but also a recruitment bonus. And we did that in light of some of the other things that we were seeing and hearing throughout the valley um, and what we were competing against with some of our surrounding school districts here on the east side um, and in central Phoenix area. So what you're seeing now is a proposed new classified non-exempt salary schedule in which you'll see there's still the classified position slash title, the grade, and now you're seeing ranges again. Um, we're looking at ranges because we feel as though we've got to go back to this area so we can be competitive and look to give individuals years of experience. We took this from our new classified schedule that you saw not too long ago, which had had that 2.5% on there from the 2020-2021 school year going into this school year. What you'll see in terms of these ranges is that we added an additional dollar on top of each area. With the exception of our bus drivers at the 110B, we gave them an additional $2. We will also look to continue our practice of the extra 75 cents for para twos and the extra 50 cents per hour for our lead custodians because of the additional duties. I also want to point out the fact that, you know, we are pressed and we need to make these changes for some of the stories that I talked about earlier, as well as the fact that we currently are sitting at over 140 vacancies within our non-exempt positions. And this goes back to that struggle of those frontline workers and that frontline labor pool. However, what I want to note too in the fact that our bus drivers in terms of getting that additional dollar on top of what everybody else would be getting is the fact that our bus drivers work a split shift. A lot of them come in in the morning and they drive their morning routes and then they have a good solid break during the middle of the day in which some of our drivers can't go back home because it's not worth it in terms of the time and distance to go back home for when they need to then be back and be ready for afternoon driving. So in terms of not only looking at them at that additional dollar for that split shift component, there's also just the dynamic again of the importance of having bus drivers to bring our students to school. If our bus drivers can't drive our students, or if we don't have enough bus drivers to drive our students, then we can't operate in what we need to do. And again, that ripple effect of all of us in terms of our positions and our roles and how we help educate our kids. I also want to make note of the fact that with this proposed new classified salary schedule, Mr. Moore and his team were able to find the dollars to help support and sustain this. And he'll talk about that more in his portion of the slides. However, this is kind of like an unfunded mandate. You know, minimum wage has gone up every year the last four plus years, but the state hasn't funded education any differently. So we're working with the same funding formula, but yet having to increase in ways that we have to find other dollars to make this work, or we have to make sure that we're budgeting appropriately to make sure that we can keep areas and sustain these in a fiscal manner. This slide shows a continuum of our classified positions, their grade and those ranges. Again, with that additional $1 on top of the hourly ranges that we had previously had. This slide also just shows up to grade 119. However, the board had approved back in the spring up to a grade 123. Again, we're gonna keep that open and available so that way if there is a need for a potential reclassification and slash or if there's a new position that comes about that might need to warrant a higher grade level, we have that opportunity available to us. In summary, 
as we compare our old schedule to our current schedule, looking at that dollar increase again for everybody, including new hires that come in, moving our minimum and not going at just the $12.80, but going to $13.45. So that way, if there's another increase next year to minimum wage, we have a little bit of time and a cushion. If certainly we have to readdress for other um, impending factors, we'll certainly do that. Again, looking at the bus driver specifically at $2 more per hour, moving back to ranges to offer years of experience. We also want to note that while reviewing this, we took an opportunity to also look at our classified exempt employees, as well as our employees that fall into this special category of managers, supervisors, and coordinators, and look at where they're at in the bigger picture. We feel that in terms of um, being equitable and also wanting them to make sure that they stay and we are able to sustain our workforce not only in our non-exempt positions but also our exempt positions that we can give $1,000 supplemental to those individuals and place it and issue new contracts or work agreements with that language. Again, we feel that this is more about retaining employees we do think it'll still be difficult. Um, we don't believe we'll all of a sudden get a rush of new individuals in our hiring pools, but what we're hoping is that showing our employees that we value them, that we care, and we know we have to address the market just like everybody else is addressing the market, that we'll be able to continue to retain them and they'll continue to see value working with us not only in terms of their wage, but also just the connection um, and other you know, benefits in which you don't necessarily see monetarily, schedules, climate and culture. I also want to address that had the bond passed, there likely would have been an opportunity to look at more, but unfortunately with that bond failure, um, and again, being fiscally responsible to the larger picture by while addressing the need that we have to because of the market, that $1 for all employees and $2 for our bus drivers um, is the most fiscally responsible path to take. I wanted to show the board as well as our community how this would impact our employees. I pulled four of the areas in which I mentioned earlier. We've struggled not only with sustaining employees, but recruiting individuals in these areas as we have a number of vacancies that are available within these classifications. But you could see what a $1 impact or $2 impact would do to these individuals, whether they're at the one-year mark or at the nine-year mark. You know, the board has approved increases for our classified non-exempt positions over the years, and Mr. Moore will bring this up also with this most recent school year going into 5%. But previous to that, our increases have been 2%, and 2% on the dollar is very minimal versus looking at a full $1 or $2 increase. The financial cost and impact of this classified hourly compensation increase is approximately $3.2 million. The increase takes into consideration the current classified hourly budget of $15.1 million and increases it to $18.3 million. In the planning phases for this classified compensation study, the district had planned to propose a $2 increase to all classified hourly staff. This is if the bond were to pass, the proposed bond would have enabled the district to move one of the middle school leases payments to the bond, therefore providing additional budget capacity for employee compensation. When reviewing the classified hourly compensation increase, it is important to note that this employee group is one of the hardest hit to the rising inflation increases. Arizona as a state has realized some of the greatest increases in inflation. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics, prices in Arizona were 14% higher in the period of 2015 to 2020. Estimating a modest increase for 2021 and 2022 at 4%, we can estimate that the inflation rate from 2015 to 2022 will be roughly 22%. In other words, $100 in Phoenix in the year 2015 would cost you $122 in 2022 for an equivalent purchase. 
Now looking at the classified hourly compensation increases over that same time, we can see in blue the actual increases from 2015 to 2021. This includes the 5% increase that was approved for the current school year. The proposed $1 increase to all classified hourly and $2 increase to bus drivers is averaged at 6% with the biggest percentage increase towards our lowest hourly employees. This proposed increase will bring the classified hourly compensation just above the estimated inflation in Arizona. The district has made this proposed increase possible from a few targeted initiatives. One initiative HR and Financial Services has been collaborating on is position cleanup. The district had several budgeted positions that the district had no intentions of filling and worked on reviewing those positions and eliminating them from the budget. In addition, the district continues to realize vacancy savings, especially in the classified employee group. The inability to fill these positions provides a savings that would, will be utilized to fund a portion of this proposed compensation increase. We would look to propose these increases to be effective on 12-20-2021, which would be reflected in the pay period 14 check. And the reason for that is because we don't want to look at splitting a payroll with there being half paid on one number and then looking at um, pay differently uh, for a day or two, and that's how it would look. It wouldn't actually be an even split. So looking at 1220 would be a clean date, and that way everything would be increased for that January 1 compliance component. We would issue new contracts and work agreements for all individuals. For our classified exempt and managers, supervisors, and coordinators, we would look at having that supplemental distributed throughout the remainder of the fiscal year, in addition to having it be put within their contract and work agreements in future years. With that, Mr. Moore and I would like to thank everybody for their time as it relates to this classified compensation study, and we will now entertain any questions that the board may have. Thank you very much. First off, I want to say, well done. It was like she was sitting in here and we were going through this presentation. So Mr. Moore, Ms. Ms. Martins, thank you. That was, that was very well done. Mm -hmm. Just as Ms. Martin said, um, our funding formula stays the same and the competition that we have of surrounding businesses, they increase their prices. We're all seeing it, we all feel it. Um, and they increase their prices to be able to offset their higher wages. We don't have that ability. That it's not optional for us. Um, so, like Ms. Martin said, it's a, it's essentially an unfunded mandate because the funding formula has not changed. Mr. Moore, it goes back to the '80s. Is that correct? Past my time. <laughs> it goes way back. Way back. We'll just say that, it goes way back. <laughs> I think the, the presentation was very well done, thank you. Questions? I just wanna um, point out our employees are our greatest resource. We've heard it from parents, we've heard it in every group we always have in here doing any study, they always say, keep the employees, keep them. Um, those, ki those people know our kids well and they treat our kids well. Um, so. I really enjoy that we're trying to get them more money, even though it was an unfunded mandate and we're trying, um, but we're trying to raise everyone and just not raise that bottom tier and make everyone else suffer. So Mrs. Martins, Mr. Moore, thank you for all the work you've put in here. I do think it was a great presentation and it was like Mrs. Martins was sitting here. So uh, thank you. Uh, but I just wanted to point out our employees are our greatest resource. And President Reese. Yes. Um, thank you for the information. Um, and definitely, as we heard just through the presentations this evening with the Cooley employees, there's always, or Cooley and Sausman employees, there's so much more that they do than, than what's on their job description anyway. So as much as we can give them is, is great. And I'm glad that we have the ability to do that. I just have one question um, for whoever can answer. Have there been other districts that have done a pay increase prior to us who have seen an increase in high, um, high in being able to hire more staff and fill those voids? 
uh, or those vacancies? I'll entertain that question. Um, good evening, President Reese, Vice President Wilson, board member Anderson. So actually there are a number of school districts in the area who made this move prior to us, um, some as early as July 1, uh, some within the last few months. And in talking with some of my colleagues at the districts, in terms of bus drivers, um, they were only able to recruit one or two. So it was actually very minimal. Uh, but again, as I mentioned in the presentation, it was more about sustaining current employees, especially as we saw everything that was happening around us, um, you know, in regards to corporations, private organizations, things of that nature. I also spoke with a school district that is near the Phoenix area, and they raised their minimum wage on July 1 to $15 an hour. And unfortunately, that does not or has not, pardon me, helped their their hiring pools. They've still struggled um, in the bigger picture with getting enough employees to want to come and do the jobs that they have open and vacant. So it's going to continue to be a struggle, as I mentioned. Okay, thank you. And you said how many vacancies? We had like over 100? Or, or In our classified or... hourly positions, we have over 140 open currently. 140, okay. And how are we competitively with um, local school districts? So I will say, um, and some of you may recall this from our classification compensation study, we're still behind some of the larger districts that surround us. However, going back to just near nature, nature of size and funding, they get so much more money than us. So some of those same districts raise theirs by a dollar to two dollars. So they're still above us. But again, going back to looking holistically at what Higley can offer in terms of the connection to our students, our community, um, and again, working with people and colleagues that really is the larger part of wanting to come to work every day is to spend time with the students and them. So I don't know that we'll ever catch up, to be honest, and Mr. Moore might want to address that a little bit more from a funding perspective, but we're always going to lag behind and we're just finding other ways um, to to let our employees know and to let our community know that we care. And Higley's worth being here for and working with. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, this may sound like a dumb question, I'm probably gonna regret asking, but um, with the school schedules, is there any uh, way for districts to help each other out if they have, like, a, you, we, they have to talk about a gap in time where some can't go home? Like, can they advertise or, you know, or get hired at another district and go help out with that district, you know what I mean, and help utilize resources. I, I hope that doesn't sound dumb, but I just didn't know, you know, if it gets to a point where we're worried about kids making it to school, then are there ways to, to work together if we're all struggling together? No, I think that's a good question, um, Board Member Anderson, and actually, our transportation director, Josh Crosby, has had some conversations with local uh, surrounding districts, and it hasn't really worked out that smoothly, but we've tried to see if there are things that we could do to help support, whether it's evening events, weekend events, et cetera, um, but that has proven to be difficult. What we typically find with our employees who are in split shift positions is that they'll work with us um, and then they'll go and work with maybe a non-educational organization and then come back with us in the evening um, or whatever that afternoon shift is in the bigger picture because there's more flexibility for them where um, for most of us we all surrounding districts kind of are on a similar schedule. So it makes it difficult to do it uh, at another school district versus at, let's just say the target, for example, down the street to pick up a couple hours in the middle of the day if, if they're needed um, versus just on um, holidays or weekends. President Reese, Board Member Anderson, to build on your question, one of the things that becomes very important is oftentimes we're competing at the same time during the beginning of the school day, after school events, for these same employees. Hence, it's hard when um, you're competing against your neighbor who can pay a, a little bit more if we can get as close as we can get because one of the things that's a challenge is for these essential services like transportation or custodial, if you can't um, hire your own employees, you're consulting or contracting services out, which are substantially more expensive. So you're paying, um, your budget is going to be hit um, either way. And uh, right now, even some of those contracted services, particularly in transportation, um, they too are struggling for employees as well. So this is truly a, a, a 
a workforce issue, and compensation is a key piece for helping us be closer to be more competitive in this, in this, in this challenge. Dr. Foley, is there any way we could have bus drivers help with lunches or any other job to move them so they aren't having this big giant gap in the middle of the day and don't want to go home for? Yes, um, President Reese, Board Member Wilson, some of them actually do. They clock in under, perhaps some of them do clock in under another code for an appropriate, um, for the appropriate position and what they're paid for that time. Some choose not to do that and do other things as well. So there are, we do have several classified individuals who have multiple roles and jobs and they are paid under the appropriate uh, classification for that role. So our employees know if there is a gap to talk to their upline of say, to say um, that they might need some help and maybe finding a different area. Mm -hmm. That would be great if we can convey that out to them um, so then we aren't having them look somewhere else. Mm -hmm. We retain the ones we have. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No. Nope. Thank you, Ms. Martins. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, President Reese, board members, we will bring this back to you for as an agenda action item at our next board meeting. Perfect. All right, since we don't have any more questions, then we will go on to 7.2, which is our 2022-2023 course guide. President Reese, Vice President Wilson, member, Anderson, it's my pleasure tonight to, to present to you three uh, course guides for the 22-23 uh, school year. I say it's my pleasure because it's been a very long process and very uh, dedicated time uh, as we look to provide opportunities for our students. And so we're very proud of the work that we've done. And tonight what we're gonna go through is I'll talk to you about our process and identify the people who have really helped push this along. We'll go through the high school course guide, the middle school course guide, and then we have an updated Higley Virtual Academy course guide that has some significant changes from last year. If you'll take a look at the people who are in the room, and I, I need to give them a ton of credit. The, the amount of conversation that we had and focus about what's the best for our students coming from a variety of angles. And so you'll see in there our instructional coaches and members of the district office, as well as we had the principal, the vice principal of uh, academics and the lead counselor at each of the different levels there. So we would have our meetings, they would be in the room and help run the process. And they're an outstanding group of educational professionals who've really done a great job in focusing and saying what's best for our kids and what can we manage within our district. So here's the timeline on how it started. So when I say a few months, our kickoff meeting was on August 18th when we talked about that group of people you just saw, what our process was gonna begin. We started it on August 25th and, and at that time, we go out to not just the instructional coaches, but to our teachers and say, what do you propose? What changes do you propose? They have about a month to turn it in. September 22nd was when the recommendations for changes to our course guide were due. And then we reviewed them together as an ed services review first, where the coaches go through and we look at each different proposal, whether it's an addition, a deletion, a change. And we, we start vetting it and seeing what additional information we, meet, we need. Our first course guide meeting is when we bring in the schools and the district people together and we go basically proposal by proposal and we talk about that. And this is where the conversation happens. A lot of times when we have two schools, one school might propose something, we have to make sure the other school is prepared and understands that as well. And we have those discussions because we need things that will meet the needs of both of our campuses. And so this is where those conversations occur through the first course guide meeting. And from that first course guide meeting, then we determine what additional information do we need. So we took two more weeks where we started having small group discussions to, uh, to bring back to the bigger group. So we would look and say, what additional information from a propose, proposal do we need, including I would have the principals get together and you write the verbiage. What do you want to see in there? Write the verbiage so that we can go through it together and then as a group we'll vet it and then bring it to cabinet to be vetted as well. And so then we had our final course guide meeting on November 3rd where we solidified the different changes that we're doing and then tonight we're here presenting it to you as an information item. 
The next step in this process would be December 8th, uh, an action item for you to approve them because we need to get started on registration starting when we come back from winter break. And so it's been a long process. Our goals in taking a look at this, we really looked at those first general information pages, it used to be the first 15 pages, it's shrunk a little bit now, about what's appropriate and what can we put in there to help support our parents as they read it and our um, principals and counselors as we help explain things. Those were our du dual filters as we look through it. We also looked at new course proposals, updated uh, descriptions. We removed some courses that have not been used in many, many years, I found. I think the longest one was seven years, but it was still in there. We got rid of it, though. And then updated our pathways, very proud on the work that we did to be able to explain to our parents easily what choices and options do you have. And then we talked about fees. So when we jump into the high school course guide, um, Let's just, I have different pieces that I'll speak to. I might not read the entire screen as I know you guys have seen this before. However, there's some highlights that I'd like to give to you, okay? Uh, the first one is the updated information about diplomas and steel, seals. We don't change that information. A lot of times the state does, so we're directing them. We have a website created where it lists all the links. So instead of calling this, oh my goodness, something changed, go to the website, take a look, because it does update and change not on our timeline. Uh, we did ask for a deadline that if you want to have a seal, let us know before the Friday before spring break. In that case, if something's missing, we're not scrambling the last week of school to try to get it changed. We have some time to make those changes. Can I um, ask a quick question right there? Yep. So I saw the request for the date. Mm -hmm. Now, are the teachers who are teaching those courses talking to these students about that? Um, I, th I think it's more coming from the from the counselor position. Okay. As they're looking at courses of study because the teacher might be that individual course. However, these the seals are really an incorporation of a lot of times the entire career, and so that's the conversations that the counselors are doing when they're doing credit checks, and and the counselors are the ones that are leading those things through them. Okay, the, so we're developing a process, or we'll have a process where that counts. Those counselors are meeting with those students because while they think. While they believe they're on a certain track or things like that, they may not realize they're eligible for certain things. Um, they they may not realize that oh, I have completed yeah. this stuff for this particular seal or that one. If we're not making sure we're talking to them about it, well, I think that's definitely something we can continue to emphasize just so that they know that there are these opportunities out there. For instance, the seal of biliteracy is, is one that goes through, and you don't even have to be in the courses. If you're a native speaker and want to do that, you need to pass the stamp test and do those things. And so the, I'm sure there's always great, greater opportunities to advertise these for the students. For sure, and like the reason I bring that up is, for instance, the courses that my daughter took at Williamsfield mm -hmm. actually ended up qualifying her for um, the STEM ahead okay. seal, but she didn't, I mean, she, someone talked to her about it, yeah. but she didn't realize those courses Aligned collectively that. would qualify for that. So that wasn't like an intention. Yeah. She wasn't looking for that. So I just want to make sure, and especially now if we're having a, requ a deadline request, mm -hmm. that people are having that conversation that we have someone looking at these courses um, and talking with these students so they understand what they are eligible for. Right. And I, I know we always talk about our counselors and, and we want to give them help and work and you know uh, support there is also these conversations need to happen prior to spring break of their senior year Correct. because somebody may be on a course um, in their like through their junior year and if someone pays attention to it, go, you know what? You're one class away from this particular seal. If this is interesting to you, then perhaps you might wanna take this as your senior year or something like that, because there's, these are involved. I mean, look at the pages here. Oh, yeah. So <clears throat> students may not realize it. So if there's somehow that we can figure out how we assist them in understanding what they may be eligible for and early on to make sure that they get the credit and accolades that they deserve, even if they weren't intentional. <laughs> Absolutely. 
maybe even at like freshman orientation, freshman orientation or yes how, yes how like some sort of making that a very quick link you know or a qr code that they can scan a parent can help scan and say hey you know if you take these classes you get the seal because i know oh. a parent will have a a bigger buy-in than maybe a counselor who has who has changed it yeah, well and and we put that deadline in because we needed the stamp test to be taken by then so it can be graded for biliteracy but then just so we can force those conversations because oh, they might have had them all through the but still we're at the end let's make sure that because I just don't, you know, we worry about someone coming in the last week of school. I, I think I have it. And we have conversations every year. We're like, whoa, now we're reviewing. Brian, our SIS manager, pulls that report. We look through it and we realize, oh, they missed one. Well, or maybe something was coded wrong. So at least it gives us some time to be able to, to uh, make changes if necessary. President Reese, members of the board, I also think it's important to remember who grants the distinctions. The diploma is, is the Higley Unified mm -hmm. School District. We, we grant the distinction of the diploma based upon the courses that you've taken. In other words, we have our Higley diploma, and then we have an additional diploma because of the courses that you've taken in your pathway. Oftentimes, when you started in your, and again, why it's important to talk about this middle school on, the courses that you took from the, very, from the onset of middle school on. The C Seals are usually, these are the ones that are issued by the state. These are the stickers that go on the diploma, depending upon which one you, you earned, um, that due to multiple criterion factors from coursework to passing of tests or proficiency exams. And so hence the importance of the link to the requirements because every year sometimes those are updated depending upon the assessment that they'll use or how they're verifying them. And that timeline is very important because when we monitor it, we have to submit it for conf confirmation to get those seals to put on diplomas, hence the timeline. So you're right, the, the um, spring break is too late to start to think you want a seal because that is something you've earned, but that's the deadline for being eligible to submit your requirement for it. So if you take a look at, we really focused one section on our test out procedures, and we felt like there was a need to explain more who was eligible to be able to test out of a course to receive credit. And so we've been working with Dr. Sue Borzich in the assessment office to really solidify the process for students who need to test out uh, for particular courses. Now remember, the focus is these aren't for kids who want to just skip a course. These are people who have gone to perhaps a non-accredited school and they want to receive core credit for it. Or I use the example of a homeschooled student would come in and if they said, hey, I've passed Algebra 1 and I've sat for my seat time, but you're not accredited. Well, now we have a process that you will take these tests. Uh, the district has created them with the coaches and Dr. Borzich and so that we can give them the test and if they pass at a 70% or above, they can receive credit for it. But once again, it's not for the, it's, we try to be specific, it's not for the person who's trying to skip. It's for the first time people enroll to try to figure out where they are and to see if we can give them credit. Uh, another part, uh, language that we felt was important for us to clarify was the high school credit for courses taken in middle school. Right now, if you take one of our world language or math courses, you get elective credit from Higley Unified School District. Remember, there's always still the requirement, especially in mathematics, you have to take four years of math. So they get that credit in middle school, they can get that elective credit for the math course. However, they are still required to take the four courses. What we were seeing was people who were transferring in from other schools where they might have taken a course in middle school and they might have been given math credit for it. Well, that doesn't make it consistent with what is happening with Higley kids. And so we've changed our uh, verbiage in there that now they will receive elective credit the same way. They are still, if they're gonna be in our school, they're still required to do four years of, uh, take, a, take a math course each of the four years. And so we felt like by changing the language in there, we were being very consistent with what other districts did as well as what's happening with our own kids because we didn't want there are certain schools that might start giving credit in seventh grade for lots of different things. I'm not gonna name any names. But when they would come in, and they're still meet, they have to meet our expectations. So we clarified that uh, with the high school credit for middle, courses taken in middle school section. We also, there was language that said you had to get a C. And philosophically, we felt like, but if you took it at the high school, you had to get a D to get credit. And so we're saying now that you have to pass the class in order to be, receive the credit. 
Um, we wanted to emphasize the withdrawal and course change procedures because this is always a sticking point uh, when you look at it. We, we emphasize that elective changes, please remember we build the schedule based upon what you request in the spring, when, starting in January actually and working through that. And then all of a sudden you want to change your mind. Well, a lot of times elective classes are closed and are very limited on what happened. And so we want them to understand that if you put in a schedule request for an elective change, it's going to be really hard to be made. Also, we had two different verbiages in there, WP for W pass and a WF for withdraw fail. And we just defined them to say, it, instead of getting a W, you would get a WP if you were passing the course when you withdrew and a WF if you were not. The implication is if you get a WP, you would still be eligible then for athletics because you'd be switching into a different class, but you can't transfer out of a class to become immediately eligible for athletics, hence the WF. Uh, also, there was a section within the course guide that talked about repeated classes, and yet we also listed it underneath the definition of the course. And there were times when those were not consistent. So in order to honestly streamline it for us, we took about the section that said repeated for credit and we focused on making sure that was in the course description. And we felt like that would be an easier to maintain and more consistent for parents. Uh, whoa, thank you. Air Force, I, I, I understand time constraints, but Air Force, ROTC, um, they teach one class every year and so what we did is we outlined what the next four-year cycle will be so they know exactly what class is going to come up. There were two courses that were listed that they're never going to teach, so we took them out. And so ROCC doesn't have a variety of classes. They teach one a year and just alternate every year. So throughout your four years, you will get all four of those classes. Now you can go. Thank you. When we take a look at CTE courses, there was a course in their freshman focus, didn't even apply to CTE. You'll see it later when we add academic focus. Uh, the neat highlights, we're adding fourth year engineering. Those are based upon the instructor's specialties. So that's why they're different. But really, there is a niche of students who this is a really important and good thing for us to be able to offer for, okay, especially since they start as freshmen and e, you know, we are allowed to receive funding for freshmen if they are in a junior class as well. So this still continues to help us with CTE. Uh, I'd like to jump in and look at the Technical Theater 1 and 2. We're really excited uh, with some of our employees from the HCPA who help run that stagecraft and building those sets and things, getting certified to come, able, come in and teach them under the CTE umbrella. This is a really good thing to help support our drama programs. Next slide, please. Um, the one I'd like to emphasize, we just changed some language to English 101 and 102. However, there was a request from one of the campuses to add a wind ensemble as the highest band. So we went back to the other campus and said, do you agree? They said that would be fine. And so it used to be listed as symphonic band. It's added an additional one, wind ensemble and symphonic to help with some growing numbers. Next slide. Mathematics, I, I, I need to give a shout out to our instructional coach, Rachel Latham. She really took on a project that said our standards have changed, our descriptions have not. I'm gonna go through and look at all of the different descriptions. So when you saw that section in the marked up version, you saw a lot of red because she really went and focused and said, this is what's gonna happen with each of the classes. And so you've, you've seen those changes. We added may be offered for dual. It used to say will be, it depends on the teacher. And we know sometimes teachers aren't available. And so we'll have to fluctuate on that. There are some courses like the algebraic functions A and B that are they're truly only for kids. Kids cannot sign up to them. There are decisions to be put in those classes by members of the IEP teams. And so we just remove them from the book. That's an internal one that we work with IEP students. It's not one that a parent can enroll in. The team will make that decision to help and support that student to place them in the right spot. I'm, oh, go back. I'm really excited about the next two. Okay, foundational college math, we always had a course called college math and, and parents would get confused about where the level at college math was. So we've renamed it, the, the, the two math departments worked together, came up with foundational college math. Because they were getting confused with the next course that we were trying to add and we're proposing, which is college algebra. We have found that there have been issues where people who really, and it really goes to accelerate early, within middle school, they reach a point in high school 
that, that you know, that it, it comes, they need more choices. We need more options than perhaps going into a Calc AB or a Calc BC class or even an AP level stats class. So we needed other choices and we did not have them. So we're adding a college algebra class. College algebra will be taken before pre-calculus or can be taken after pre-calculus. And so it gives them a different option and a dual credit option, especially for seniors who might not be going into a math-related field. Therefore, they might not be needing calculus when they go to college. But this is a great course for them to have through Chandler Gilbert and its college algebra. And so it's one of the ways that we're gonna address the concern of people accelerating and then getting stuck in a position where they didn't have any other choices. So you're gonna see this choice, you'll see another choice when we get to HVA, another option for kids to take. Next slide, please. Um, you'll take a look, I'm not gonna talk about each one of these, but we did look at the prereqs for science, there weren't any listed. So they went in and looked at them, especially for the AP courses. For those people who, AP Chem might be one of the hardest AP classes you have to take. It's really important for you to have Honors Chem to be able to prepare you for that. AP Bio needs the Honors Bio as well. And so we put those in there so that people understand what they need to get to those AP. I know I'm talking to a science teacher, so there are those levels. So we wanted them to understand where it was. Um, the difference would be AP Physics, AP Physics, uh, one and AP Physics two are algebra-based, or AP Physics C is calculus-based, and that would need a different prerequisite than the physics ones. Um, we can't call AP Sp or pre-AP Spanish four. Pre-AP is now a copyrighted phrase through the College Board, so we had to change it to honors. We're not allowed to use it. Um, and we did add two semester-long non-departmental electives for astronomy and oceanography. Uh, to, we want to judge interest in them. Uh, we didn't put them in the science part because I don't want people to get confused. They're not being offered for science credit right now. They're being offered as non-departmental electives to see where they're at. And there is a possibility that we look at combining them in the future, but we needed to judge interest and to see truly what the level would be and how that would work. And so both campuses agreed that the semester-long electives will help us with the astronomy and oceanography. Okay. Um, Okay, jump to the middle. Go back to that last one because I got to give her a shout out too. Nope, the other one. The World Language Course Description. So we have a wonderful new World Language Instructional Coach, Rebecca Rodriguez. She was the Teacher of the Year last year in case you didn't uh, meet her. She's done a wonderful job as we move to proficiency-based assessment through the stamp test, which required changes to the descriptions of our courses. And so you saw that when you saw the review, you saw a lot of the World Language ones as strikethroughs because she really focused on that. And so I really wanted to make sure that she was acknowledged for that work. You will learn a lot more about DLI and about world language when they come in January, but we're anticipating that and changing the guide to meet the needs. We will also be celebrating her tomorrow night at the Gilbert Excellence. So. Okay. All right, the pathways. So what we tried to do is took a look at how can we explain the courses not related to what grade you're in. And if you refer to our last our previous course guides, there were, it was all grade-based. And there were three different pathways. And we called one rigorous, and we called the other one highly rigorous. Well, we felt to be a lot more consistent, we're gonna call it the honors pathway. And, and it doesn't matter where you start, it's where you're at, and then you can look and see the other options. And, and once again, I'd like to thank Rachel Latham in math for working on this, but then it spread to all of the other core content areas. How can we truly explain better to parents, not based upon what grade you're at, but what course you're in, what choices you have? So you see the college algebra in there, and, and that's really what spurred it, is hey, we're adding a new course, let's change this. How can we make it easier for parents to understand? We think this way is gonna make it a lot easier for parents to understand. Still lots of options, right? But uh, there, you'll, you'll see in the book that we updated all four, not just the uh, mathematics pathways. All right, let me take a breath. We'll get into the middle school course guides here. All right, for our middle school course guide, once again, same process that we did. We looked out, we changed the language for the high school credit to be consistent. So if they read one, they're gonna read the other. It's always gonna be the same. We had an intermediate dance class because there was a need. We found they were differentiating anyway, so let's make it formal. So now you have a beginner and intermediate and advanced danced. Um, once again, we changed the world languages. Um, that changed Mandarin 1 and Mandarin 2 to be named Immersive Mandarin 7 and 8. You'll learn a lot more about that. 
when we come in January, but that's just going to help uh, some of the dual language uh, immersion students as they come up through. Uh, one of the sticking points always is campuses are a little bit different. And what's really popular at one campus might not be as popular as another, and how do we combat trying to meet both needs? And so a good example of that is the applied technology and robotics courses used to be just eighth grade. Cooley said, I have a lot of seventh graders that are interested, but I'm not putting them in there. Can we add that? Sossman said, we always have too many kids in there you know, that are interested. How do, we, how do we find a middle ground? And so our middle ground is we will say it offered to seventh and eighth grade, but please understand that registration for priority will be given to eighth graders. They will get into that class first. It also spurred and a challenge for them to look and say, well, can there be a second level robotics class? Can I do something additional? And so their challenge is through the year to look at that when we come back to this process next year. How does that change the flow? And what different op uh, options can we give for our students in there? Sorry, I had a quick question. Yep. Um, is there a priority always given to eighth grade students for it class? Is. That's what I thought there was always it, it, a priority, is, like for I, the languages and such. I thought they always had priority. They, Am I wrong? They, they are, but this okay. helps spell it, spell it out specifically. Okay, great. Them. I was just thinking yes. that we always gave priority to those yeah. eighth grade on, students. On the in, electives. On the electives. Okay, yes. Thank you. It is. However, we felt like if I just put that as a sentence at the front of the book, that might not hit it. But when someone's looking at that guide specifically to make that choice, they can see that there. Great. Thank you. Um, the language was very different from the middle school to the high school guides, and so we felt like we wanted consistency from 7-12. So you'll see the language has been removed from accelerated and changed to honors, okay? Um, and so you'll see that we, we want to get used to that language as we move forward. Um, once again, Rachel worked on replacing our mathematics descriptions. We had two courses, Conceptual Physics 7, and so they were the same course. And they were allowing different kids because it helps in scheduling. So they said, can we just call it conceptual physics and either seventh or eighth graders can be? Yes, let's simplify the process and do that. And so that's why you'll see there. We are excited to say there's an honors version of Social Studies 7 and Social Studies 8, which has been asked for repeatedly over the years. And so we are, um, you know, when you get in this top of, topic of honors, it's not just more work. Truly, how differentiated can we make it in different? And that's been a process that uh, Ashton Lee, our, our instructional coach, and Dr. Chris Treat are looking at within the social studies. And then just some name, name changes for our ELAS program to be consistent, because it used to say advanced. Once again, we're going away from advanced or accelerated terminology. And so we wanted to clearly define that the social studies class is ELAS as it combines with the humanities course. HVA was probably one where we, we did a lot of work in, okay? And I, I need to give Mr. John Dolan credit, the principal, as he has gone through this semester, and we have looked at different things that we could offer and things that we didn't realize last year that we needed to change. And so uh, when you took a look at that section, you noticed there was a lot of things that got removed because they weren't possible, and now we're adding other things in to fit the needs of our kids and what we are doing. There are some courses that will be offered in HVA that are not offered in the brick and mortar schools. We have Florida virtual curriculum that will allow them to be taught, um, but they will not be. However, high school students can be concurrently enrolled. They can take five classes at Williamsfield and one class at HVA, or four classes at Higley High, two classes at HVA, or vice versa. They just can't take three and three because I gotta have a home school. So you got to go one way or the other. Who owns you, right? And, uh, but this is going to give us flexibility. Um, we felt like we needed to find more that students can take six courses or what we get funded upon. When they get to the seventh course, if they want to take it then HVA, we do have a fee associated because those are the costs that, are, that cost us. Remember, the teachers aren't paid by FTE. They're paid per student and the materials and the fees and the different things. So that's why you see a fee. And then we wanted to define that they can't take eight courses or nine courses. You get seven, and, and that's, where you, that's where we do that. So as we go through the HVA course guide, understand that there's been a lot of thought looking at it, knowing that we have flexibility, especially on the high school side, to help support students. Quick question there. Yep. I'm assuming that we will allow them to perhaps take additional electives on campus mm -hmm. and take that seventh course that may be a required course yes. for them through HVA. 
like with the astronomy and the oceanography. Yeah. And I mean, that may be of interest and they may have all these interests that are only offered at the schools. So they may choose to take an English class online. Is it doesn't matter which one they take online. And so yes. they can as do long that. as it's offered what we can do. Yes. And, and so, you know, maybe a, a good example would be um, students who have release time don't want to have a zero hour or something. And so they take their history class online, but or if they want to come in for specialty electives or still participate in some, uh, you know, athletics or, or the band or something like that, they still have those options and that flexibility to do that. Perfect. Thanks. So in looking at the guide, we've updated. What we found is we have those concurrent enrollment students, but we also have full-time HVA students. And for both the middle school and the high school, we needed to find some electives that if they stayed within four years, they would have enough, and they're not just repeating the same courses over and over. So you'll see some courses that have come in here that are not in our traditional guide, right? Uh, the peer counseling one is a, is a really interesting course. Mr. Dolan leads it himself. And it's really, how are we supporting them being online students? and getting them to support each other. And so he's piloted it this year, and we're excited to continue to do that, especially for students who are struggling, and we can help them through that peer counseling. Um, visual Art 1 and Visual Art 2, Computer Science Discoveries, just different options that we can give that we can teach using that curriculum, especially for the middle school kids. There's not a ton. Well, and, and to be honest, there's not a ton of kids in the middle school. I think we're up to 30, 32 kids, both seventh and eighth grade combined. And so we needed to provide and find options for them. When we get into the high school, we did have to, you, we talked about diplomas and SEALs before. One of the issues is that Chandler Gilbert will not recognize an online course for dual credit. They will not accredit it, so we will not be able to offer any dual enrollment courses online. Dual enrollment courses tie in with our AP courses, and so right, as of right now, we're not going to be offering those courses online. You need those courses to have the Advanced STEM Diploma, formerly the STEM Ahead of Diploma, or the Advanced Honors for Excellence in Academics Diploma. So you'll notice in the course guide, we took them out. Now remember, like a, a someone who's going to Williamsfield and only taking one course online, that's not gonna affect them. They're still gonna have all the other choices and different things like that. It's just, we need to be for the full-time, four-year possible HVA graduates to understand we won't be able to offer those courses because they need that dual enrollment. And those are our, some of our upper level classes. Will that be the same if HVA is their home school? Uh, if there is, is at their home school, we would have to take a look at um, how, how much are they truly then taking back at the brick and mortar. There could be a possibility for that, but there would be a unique circumstance that we would look through. And if that's the case, we would offer that. Not at all, but I just didn't right. want to put it in the guide and people are thinking, hey, that's one reason we're going there. We would look at a specific situation, but they, it, they would have to take the majority brick and mortar. Gotcha. Well, to, yes, to really... because the course guide, is, like you said, it's more for those who this yeah. is their course of, yeah, exactly, like of education. Of okay. And so... Um, we had some attendance is a big issue with online. And so we want to be able to clear that parents and everyone knows how much weekly they have to turn in their attendance, all of that. And so we spelled that out within the course guide. Okay. Uh, we, we looked at math. The, the second one down is the one I'm excited about. So we talked about college algebra being an option for students who, who didn't want to go into calculus and had met that need and know that that's not their path. Now, the second option that we have for them to address this is an on-level probability and statistics course that they could take through HVA as well. We offer AP stats in person, but not an on-level stats class. This is an on-level stats class. Kids could take after pre-calculus, um, or depending on the student, if they needed to be after algebra two. There's some things that we can look at, but it's just a second way that we can address the concerns that we're seeing. And I'm really excited about uh, offering that opportunity for our kids online. So that kid could take five classes in person and their math class could be the one that's online. And it could be an on-level stats class. Um, I, the last one I, I want to jump into this year, we piloted American Sign Language and it has been very popular. We have 42 kids in the class and we're excited to do that. They're, the curriculum is there. We have one of our teachers who doesn't, She's not a sign language teacher for us, but she has those skills and has been able to teach those courses. And so we're, and she's agreed to do it again next year. So we're really excited about that. Once again, gives you an option. If students want to take sign language, currently we don't have it in our brick and mortar, 
Perhaps this is a class that they could take through HVA and it could be one of their six courses. Um, once again, we needed more electives. We were running out of electives. And so we looked and Mr. Dolan went through and found electives that would fit our need and fit our timing that we could offer specifically for HVA students. And so when you take a look at them, um, and I said, social media, we're not just getting on Twitter, right? No, it's much more involved in the curriculum. It's much more than that. But uh, taking, those are just different options, especially for those kids so they're not repeating the same online course to get their electives should they be a four-year HVA student. We go back to that one. I think personal finance and literacy, like we just need to point that out. That's, we've had yeah. parents asking us for that for a long time in the brick and mortar. In the brick. So I. So it's a semester long course that we're able to add in there that has a curriculum through Florida Virtual that we can offer. Thank you for cool. having that because we've had parents. It's been a, a big conversation of trying to get that into our high schools. Yeah, and they wanted their so. kids to learn to write checks in school. And I think it's great that we now have something to, I know, Michelle. I know. <laughs> Just to understand interest yeah, rates. Abso and, absolutely. Yeah. So just a little plug there that I think that could be popular in, in the brick and mortar as well. So fees, and this is where I need to acknowledge our director of finance, Sharon Rushkamp, who came in and met with us as well, because there's been things from the finance perspective that they've come up and butted up against issues. And one of the big ones is that first one. And this is especially hit can be any club. We had a limit that said a club could only charge $20 but their needs were much more than that. And yet in finance, they said, nope, we can't do anything more. That's all you can collect. And so what we've asked and what we're asking you to do is approve the ability for anywhere from one to $400 based upon the need of the program. There are some programs, especially at the high school, where because we couldn't charge this, now we're using booster clubs to help support and do those things. We'd rather some of that come back into us. Now, boosters are always going to be very necessary, especially in our big programs, and that parent support is wonderful, and our community is great at that. But this will allow us to have some different controls on it, and it's going to be based upon the need of the, uh, of the program. Yep. What, what clubs would need up to 400? Like okay, uh, a great one would be a winter guard. Uh, okay, something like that. So you're thinking, you're thinking, and so, so, so right now, if they can only charge twenty dollars, some of them didn't even have clubs because that's such a nominal cost to what it actually costs the kids. Now, the cost for the kids not going to change. It let's, I, I want to say, it, it costs anywhere from six hundred, eight hundred dollars to be a member of the Winter Guard for just one winter season. And a lot of times, those parents are paying, and, and the booster club is going through that and supporting it. And then, as a district, we're supporting different, that's some transportation or some entry fees and things. What this would allow them to do is charge, and, and that that fee for the club then would be they would go in, and then the director would have direct control over it. All right, and we would be able to either pay additional positions for coaching or, you know, some of those different stipended amounts. It gives us some different control over it. Now, we know, just like you get into high school, things are expensive, right? And there's lots of costs in there. But this gives us a different level of control to be able to do that, whereas before we couldn't, right? Got to 20 bucks. And, and I will even go, to like, maybe to an elementary art club or something like that where the fee, they might need supplies that might cost $40 a kid. Well, they could charge 20, and this is where Sharon was able to come in and explain, we have a bigger need, you know, and, and in working with Tyler and Sharon and our principals, we felt like 400 was an appropriate amount, and then we would manage and monitor <clears throat> what they're charging. Because we also don't want it to be too much, and then they have money that sits in there. That's, that's not appropriate, right? We <coughs> charge what you need so that we can use it on the kids that are currently in the club. Yeah. Instrument rental fee. We I was just going to say, year. as always, if a family has difficulty that paying goes without any saying, of yes. these fees, yeah, that we can. And the principals have the discretion to waive the fees. Yes. Like there is that part of it when those things happen. Yes, there is supports built in. The instrument rental last year went from seventy-five to one hundred. This year we're asking one hundred to one hundred. Here's why: an instrument goes down. It costs us one hundred and fifty is the low end. It costs a lot more. When those uh, instruments get done, 125 for a year is an incredible amount to rent an instrument from, okay? And it's still a great opportunity that we're supporting. But we just found that we were going into the negative when we were doing uh, what we needed to in terms of repairing those instruments. 
And privately, we rented a violin for my mm -hmm. daughter, and it was much, much more much, than much 125. More. I think that may have been her case at one yeah. point. Like, <laughs> I think I spent that on a case for the violin yes. at some point. So I, I think that this is well needed that we have increased it so we can maintain some of those instruments that I had heard was in some closet because they were broken and we need the money to fix. So and we need the money to fix and yes. you know we're addressing the instrument concern. We brought it last year. We have an instrument replacement budget every year that we are also expanding you know our inventory into helping support specific needs throughout and there's a great 10-year plan that the, uh, the, the music instructors put together, the band instructors put together and I'm really proud of that that we can support that. That was last year's budget. Um, we just put in lines to let you know we have a laptop and we have a laptop charger. We didn't put a money, we said actual amount because as Mr. Pasek will tell you, six months ago a laptop was cheaper than it is now. And so for us to replace it, it's gonna be actual cost and we'll work with IT for that. And then finally we looked at the parking passes. $60 was on the low end of what was going on around here. Uh, we chose to move it to $80. It really helps support. We're gonna need to, we just spent some money to make them look pretty. We're gonna need some money to keep them up, some upkeep, uh, as well as we can do some different things for security throughout the parking lots from there. Yes, thank you for all the speed bumps at <laughs> Williamsfield. It's awesome. Well, we do our best. Yeah, so please go slow. You know, if I'm going fast enough, I can miss the next one. Okay. <laughs> well, it's your Just truck then, anyway. Um, <laughs> Just teasing. So, but when we looked at the fees, we felt like those are very appropriate things for us to do, and we'll meet the needs of what we're trying to accomplish within our district. And do once we again, still sell out of our parking passes? How we do. Okay, so yeah. this isn't going to be... No. Okay, so we're still selling out of our parking passes Correct. every year. Okay. Yes. Uh, and, and once again, I, I can't say thank you enough to the, the wonderful committee that we had leading it, you know, and, and we had voices in the room that had great experience, and it's that conversation that led, I think, to a really quality course guide and offerings for our students and explainable for our parents as they're going through and making choices. And so from our instructional coaches and, and our directors and our site level people, um, when we got together, it, it was a great conversation of a group of educators saying, what, what's the best thing that we can do and how do we meet the needs and get over some hurdles that we have? And uh, interesting dialogue. We didn't always agree, but we came to consensus. And I think that's really important, and I'm proud of them for that. I like the 7-8 language for the middle school and eliminating the others. I think it eliminate confusion between the high school and the middle school. Yes. I think a lot of people thought they were taking a different class or on a different path, and then your flow chart's beautiful. Yeah, they, they, they did a great, great job. job. Yeah, so much easier. President Reese, members of the board, we are super proud of the leadership from Ed Services, this entire team. This is the third year of following a consistent process where you involve this kind of consensus building understanding. It allows for their, your document to be a true, more reflection of what's going on and consistency across the campuses. A lot of work went into this. We are so proud of our leaders, our, our counselors, our instructional coaches. Uh, well, well, well done. Good work here. Yes, thank you. A lot of cleanup. And to simplify, it helps prevent confusion and problems later and questions and people trying to sign up for classes that really just aren't there and then trying to get into a different one. And so thank you. I know that was a lot of work for everybody and with the addition of HVA. So we added a course guide, <laughs> so thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Then we're gonna go on to our action items. I move that we approve the amendment to the intergovernmental agreement between East Valley Institute of Technology and the Higley Unified School District. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That motion carries 3-0. All right. Do we have any other future agenda items? I know we have them pretty spelled out. What's coming to us when? Anything else? It's still pretty full. 
in addition to working on all of this stuff. I, I am really looking forward to the world language overview, though. So, yes. All right. Well, if we don't have anything else, I move that we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Have a good evening. Happy Thanksgiving and enjoy your families. <laughs>